excellent to the rector UNESA, Prof. Nur Hasan, excellency to head of department primary teacher education, University of Surabaya, DRS Mintohari, MPD, Excellency Mrs. Lily Taylor, PhD, as a speaker and lecturer of Edith Cowan University, Western Australia. Excellency Dr. Cullen Fletcher as the speakers and consultoria from Mozambique, South East Coast of Africa. Excellency Prof. Dr. Kusairi MPD as speaker and the lecturer of Win Sunan Ampel, Surabaya. Honorable Mrs. Ruwaida Safira SPD as a moderator and lecturer of primary teacher education, UNESA, and of the course, Excellency Distinguished Guys, Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, as our audience today. In a today's seminar, we would learn how to teach should face threats and challenge for education in 21 success story in the education world. Development always occur and expectedly and teacher must be a key in adjusting to the latest development. Of course, to deal with the situation, we need teacher resource that qualifies in their field and able to face all challenges and there in the future. One of the things that we can do as prospective teacher or have even managed to become a teacher is understanding how to achieve this qualification. I hope this seminar will help you to know more about how to become an excellence educator in 21 century. This webinar was organized by Primary Teacher Education Department and has gathered around 2,000 participants, both from within the country and from abroad. I hope this webinar can provide useful thing for participants and committees, also strengthening the good relationship between our major and institution in the internal international field. I would also like to thank to all three outstanding speak, speaker, Mr. Lily Taylor, Mrs. Mrs. Lily Taylor, Mrs. Colin, and Mr. Kusheri, who will deliver new knowledge to us. And for all of the distinguished audience, welcome to the our webinar. Hopefully, you can utilize this time by gathering knowledge as many as possible. Well, I don't want to take too much of your time before. I hand over it, Mrs. Sinta, our Todis MC. On behalf of UNESA, I am officially open this international webinar entitled Improvement of Education in 
in the 21th century. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for Mr. Nusalim for the welcoming speech and the opening remarks. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, before we come to the main session, let us start this by praying first. So the event that we behold today will run well without any obstacle at all. Pray based on individual belief begins. be done. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now our deep pleasure of main session, that is presentation. This presentation will be led by our moderator, Mrs. Ruaida Zafira, SPDMA. Please let us present to you the curriculum video of our moderator today. So as we can see on the screen, Mrs. Raida Zafira is alumnus from Elementary School Education, Universitas Negeri Surabaya in 2015, and also an alumnus from Master of Arts in Education, University of Tsukuba, Japan in 2019. For the work experience, she used to work as a staff from International Office Universitas Negeri Surabaya. And now she is one of the lecturer in Elementary Teacher Education, Universitas Negeri Surabaya and of course with Ayman's international experience. So without waiting any longer, Mrs. Abira, time is yours. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Sinta. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to lead this special session today. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Before we begin, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Fira, as it's already mentioned by the MC. I'm here as my function as moderator. I'm very delightful to see you here and welcome each and every one of you to this seminar. The topic of today's seminar is improvement of education in 21st century, prospective teachers facing threats and challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, also today, we have three amazing speakers, both from Australia and Indonesia. Aligned with that, allow me to introduce our distinguished speakers. Start from our first speaker. With us today, Ibu Lili Taylor, PhD, MSc, MCONS. Good afternoon, selamat siang, Ibu Lili. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yeah, sure, oh, I can hear brilliant. you. <laughs> Thank That's you always good to hear. <laughs> sure, thank you. Thank you for your willingness to be a part of today's seminar, Ibu Lili. Thank you so much for your invitation. <laughs> thank you. And our second speaker today is Dr. Colin Fletcher. Good afternoon, Ibu Colin. Good afternoon. It is indeed such a privilege and a pleasure to be with you. And with me, it's still early morning in Mozambique. <laughs> Okay, good morning then. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> we have different time. Okay. And I just have to apologize quickly that I have tried to put the virtual background on, but for some reason I disappear if I put it on. So um, you, yeah. I, I apologize. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. No worries. No background, it's okay. <laughs> okay, and... With us today also, our third uh, speaker is Professor Dr. Kusairi MPD. Assalamualaikum. Selamat siang, Prof. Waalaikumsalam, Ms. Safira. Thank you. Thank you for your availability in today's seminar. Okay. Yeah, I hope we can learn more from our speaker's presentation today. I'm sure our three speakers with their expertise and experience can open up our horizon regarding progressive and authentic education system in 21st century. For all the participants, be ready and give your best attention for three upcoming sessions we have. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Before we proceed to the main agenda of today's seminar, I would like to inform you that for today's seminar, we will have plenary session with our outstanding speakers. The speakers will deliver their presentation in order. Start with Ibu Lili, continued by Ibu Colin and Clothes by Professor Kusairi. Each speaker will have 30 minutes for presenting the materials and at the end, we will have 30 minutes for a question and answer session together with all the speakers. For all the participants who wants to give the question, you don't have to wait till the end of the session. If you already have the question, you can directly address it in the chat room, both in Zoom and YouTube. Also, we have to inform you that besides written question, in the Q&A session, we will prioritize a direct question from the audience. Therefore, don't worry. We will give you the opportunity to interact with the speaker directly. So prepare your question well. Okay, for the last rule, we are kindly invite all the participants to keep the microphone on the mute mode. Ladies and gentlemen, moving along to our first session, please allow me to share a brief profile of Ibu Lili Taylor, PhD, MSEM Counts. I will share screen the CV. Wait a second. Okay, CV of Ibu Lily Taylor. Yeah, Doctor Lily. Taylor is a senior lecturer in primary science education for the School of Education at Edith Cowan University. She earns her Master of Natural Sciences in Austria in 1995. In 2003, she completed her Doctoral of Philosophy at Curtin University of Technology. In 2013, she earns her second master degree majoring in counseling, University of Notre Dame, Australia. Dr. Lily Taylor is consistently doing research. It is proved by some journal articles, conference publications, and book chapters are produced by her from 2012 to 2020. If I scroll down, you can see her research with various title, titles. And also Dr. Lily Taylor active in supervising activity as principal and co-principal supervisor, both for master and doctoral students. If we read the title here, we might know that Dr. Lily Taylor research interests are about science and STEAM education, Counter terrorism education, values education, girls education, cultural preservation education, and counseling research. Okay, well, I'm sure Dr. Lily Brief Provile can be a really good example for us and can boost us to be more productive and innovative. <laughs> All right, without further ado, please welcome Ibu Lily Taylor. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. So I only need to share my screen now and sure, I hope it I will, will work. Yeah. I can stop share, then you can start your okay. share screen. Yeah. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it clearly. Can everyone see it? Just do a quick wave. Yeah, I'm Brilliant. sure. Everyone can see it. <laughs> okay, that's wonderful. Because that's usually the challenging moment. Can we get my presentation up on the screen. <laughs> okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and peace be upon you. Um, I would like to talk today about how Australian primary teacher education, or as you call it, elementary teacher education, um, can happen or should happen in the 21st century or in the so-called Anthropocene 
the Anthropocene being a new geological era that has been suggested. And I'm going to come back to that in a little while. Um, I will touch on the challenges and opportunities that our teacher education students are experiencing. So my plan is to talk to you about challenges for primary educators in the Anthropocene. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how primary education fits into the Australian education system and why it is particularly important for um, the purpose of speaking about the challenges in the 21st century. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a current debate that's happening in Australia about generalists versus subject specialists and also about education for sustainability in the context of STEM or STEAM education. And I'm gonna finish off with a little bit of visioning for what the 21st century primary teacher education in Australia, but maybe in other countries like yours as well could look like. Okay, without further ado, what the situation we are currently finding ourselves in is, and I don't need to go into too much detail because everyone who's got eyes and ears and watches the news is fully aware that our earth is an incredibly fragile place that is currently under enormous threats. We've got wildfires racing through Europe. We've got massive flooding throughout Europe. We have had here in Australia, we have unprecedented rainfalls, which we have not had since um, European occupation here. So things look like they are changing worldwide. We might also have come to appreciate that there is a lot of um, economic drivers that uh, and political drivers that um, are regarded as responsible for the current situation that we are in. And so basically we are ending up with a world that is at a tipping point where it really depends on the next few years. I mean, some people say 2050, but that appears to be too far away. Um, it is a tipping point where we can still save our world and there is still the option of um, maintaining the natural ecosystems and those really delicate and very fine-tuned systems that have maintained life on earth for millennia versus ending up with a planet that is completely overheated and where life on earth will never be the same and will become increasingly difficult. So with that little background, um, some people have uh, coined the current era as the era of the Anthropocene. Anthropocene is arrived from the Greek words anthropos, which means man or human, and sene, which is new. So basically it's the new age that is influenced by humans. And this term was coined by Eugene Stormer, who is a biologist and Paul Crutzen, a chemist in the year 2000 already. Some people have said, uh, we cannot be sure whether we actually are in a, in a new age already and in, in a geological era, because the current official age we are in is still the Holocene. So it is still an unofficial unit. There is actually an Anthropocene working party that is a community of researchers and they are trying to find evidence whether or not we have actually entered a new geologic, geological age. Evidence appears to say that um, there has been a dramatic increase in human activity impacting the planet. 
Some people say it started with the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century. Other people are drawing the line after the explosions of atomic bombs after, um, during and uh, after World War II, because this, there is a um, there is evidence of nuclear fallout all across the world that is a clear marker that basically marks that shift into a new era. So this is an age where we are unlikely to get away with business as usual. And of course, this also affects how we educate teachers and how we prepare those teachers who will prepare the decision makers of the future. So this is basically the background I would like to speak to you from. Mahatma Gandhi once said that the earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not every man's greed. And to me, this statement really summarizes what we are on about when we talk about the challenges of the Anthropocene. This is where education for sustainability enters the scene and where education for sustainability can give us hope that we may turn things around still. Education for sustainability is not the same as environmental education or sustainability education, both of which are very, are very content driven. So basically when you do environmental education or sustainability education, you're more concerned that your students learn all the necessary content that is to know about sustainability. Education for sustainability is different in as much as it fosters things like planetary stewardship, which means it fosters care for the planet. It fosters global citizenship, the awareness that we are in this together, all of us. And it doesn't matter whether you live in Greenland or in Australia or in Brazil, we are all in this situation together. Furthermore, education for sustainability fosters humane relationships, which means empathy for each other. And being aware that everything I do affects everybody else because we are all connected. Now care, awareness and empathy are issues that are unlikely to be conveyed to students if we only stick to content teaching. So we need to do a little bit more than that. And this is where, why education for sustainability is different. So what is it? We can say that education for sustainability does develop the knowledge, skills, but also values and worldviews that are necessary for people to act in ways that contribute to more sustainable patterns of living. And the main focus is here on act, because simply by conveying content, that does not mean that people will actually act on their knowledge. So we need to give our students opportunities to think about what they value, what kind of a world do they value and what worldviews will foster a more sustainable life in the future. It enables individuals and communities to reflect on the ways how we interpret and engage with the world. So this is just in a nutshell what education for sustainability is. So how is, how is education for sustainability implemented in the Australian teacher education system? And as you can see, there's a big question mark there and I put it there on purpose. In the Australian curriculum, we have what we call a cross-curriculum priority that is sustainability. 
And cross-curriculum priority means that it is something, an issue that is supposed to be taught in all the learning areas or subjects as you might refer to. Now, is this happening that way? Just to give you a brief overview of the education system in Australia, in kindergarten, which is, you know, the, the four year olds, there is still quite a bit of sustainability education because children are being taken out into nature, they are being um, given opportunities to engage with nature. In pre primary, which is the five year old kids, um, that's where the children still have quite a bit of opportunity, quite a few opportunities to engage with nature and to develop a sustainable view of the world. And then we enter primary school, which is in Australia, which covers years one to year six, before it's followed by secondary schools from year seven to 12. It is a well-known fact that children enter primary schools, at least in Australia, and I don't know if that's the case in Indonesia or in Mozambique, but in Australia, kid, children enter primary schools with a sense of wonder, with a sense of interest and enthusiasm about nature. And they leave primary schools in many cases without enthusiasm and without interest. So something happens in these crucial years of primary education where we lose a lot of kids' interests. We also know that in secondary schools in Australia, sustainability is, hmm, is very difficult to fit into an incredibly crowded curriculum. It's not that people don't want to do it, it's just there is so much to do. Moreover, there is national testing that is NAPLAN testing. Okay, sorry, sorry. There is my, my PowerPoint seems to be taking over. <laughs> okay. Okay, so there's national testing, so-called NAPLAN testing, which is literacy and mathematics numeracy testing that dominates primary schools into lower secondary. And then upper secondary levels are completely exam driven. So this is what stands in the way of education for sustainability being uh, effectively integrated into secondary schools, but it already starts in primary schools. So what do we do about it? Australian primary teachers are educated and are expected to be generalist teachers. What that means is they're supposed to develop broad knowledge and understanding in all the subject areas at the time of graduation. Now that's of course a big ask. Generalists have more opportunities to integrate curriculum, which means this is um, a time, at least in theory, where you could integrate sustainability into your teaching. We know that integrated curriculum matches real life much better. And in my particular context, because I teach primary science education at my university, we, um, we know that student engagement in science learning is enhanced through teaching an integrated curriculum that better matches real life. So a few years ago, the Australian government introduced so-called subject specializations into primary teacher education courses. Now this is new because that means that uh, pre primary pre-service teachers now in their last year of their study, they have to choose a specialization and that can be mathematics, it can be science, it can be the arts, it can be physical education, whatever they want to specialize in. 
at my university, I teach two of three subject specializations for science. One of these uh, units teaches our pre-service teachers how to do curriculum integration for upper primary, which means I teach a lot of STEM or STEAM education. And this is where I bring in sustainability. So those specialization units, they serve for our fourth year, uh, almost graduating teachers to engage in best practice in science teaching, which is often described as collaborative, inquiry-based and student-driven. Traditionally, curriculum integration is very important for also for those specialists, primary teachers. Education for sustainability is something I put a great emphasis on because I am in that lucky position that I've got these students <laughs> that I can influence. But I am aware that I can only influence those students who are in my units and who have chosen science, if that makes sense. Furthermore, I put a lot of emphasis on identifying and teaching socio-scientific issues or values, because to me, they are intrinsically in, uh, in, they are intrinsic in sustainability and in STEAM learning. I want to just quickly run you through a sequence of lessons or STEAM lessons that I teach my students. And you can see how I try to scaffold the theme of sustainable oceans. This is just a brief example. So for example, we start with activities that look at what sinks, what floats. So in science, this looks at buoyancy, this looks at uh, density, this looks at displacement and why certain materials sink and other materials float. On that basis then, I ask my students to build a raft, a raft that has to fulfill certain quality criteria, which involves, of course, a raft has to float. A raft has to withstand wild weather and big waves. So the waves are usually done with the hands, you know, in a water basin. Um, big storms are simulated by using hair dryers and fans, just simply to simulate what would be happening in a primary classroom, because obviously you don't have real storms or you don't have real waves in your water basin where you're trialing your rafts. After they have built the raft, and this is important, after they have built the raft, I get them to map the curriculum. And I get them to map the curriculum for building a raft from all the learning areas. So we start with science, we then do technology, engineering, the arts, mathematics, and then everything else like the humanities, how can we bring health and physical education into the picture? And so basically you've got the raft in the middle and then how can we approach the raft from all the learning areas that we have available in the primary curriculum? After this very important exercise is done, um, I ask them to turn their raft into an oil platform. What would they need to change on a raft to turn it into an oil platform? What are the success criteria to be a successful oil platform? Now, usually this has something to do with how well they are anchored in the ground so that they don't float away. And so, and certain other criteria that are negotiated between the students. Next up, as you might have guessed, we now look bring in sustainability where we uh, imagine what happens when our oil platform runs into trouble and we have an oil spill so one way of teaching values or bring ethics into steam education is through ethical dilemma story pedagogy 
where we use storytelling to introduce a potentially ethically challenging or contentious issue. In this case, I show a brief trailer of the movie Deep Water Horizon, which was one of the worst oils, uh, oil, <laughs> oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico, and where we still, 10 years after, have the after effects of this terrible, terrible oil spill. This brief trailer is then used as the uh, introduction to an ethical dilemma discussion, which has at its core the discussion of ethical values in relation to sustainable oceans and the use of fossil fuels. This then leads to another building activity, which is to build an oil spill barrier. Okay, and then, you know, obviously those lessons could be taken further over a whole term, if you like, you could work for 10, 12 weeks on this particular topic. So this is just to give you an idea to run you through how I teach my students to scaffold a particular topic that they could address with their students to cover sustainable oceans in a STEAM environment. There has been a lot of debate about generalists versus subject specialists in Australia. And sadly, because we know from research, science creates a lot of anxiety for many primary teachers. Many primary teachers in Australia feel uncomfortable with teaching science. So what happens is that in many schools, the science specialists, basically the students I now train, teach all the science lessons. Now you might say, what could there possibly be that could be a problem? Critics say that the trend to specialize along subject demarcation lines leads to silo mentality. And what that means is that Teachers who were originally generalists thinking very broadly and across a range of learning areas now suddenly focus entirely on one learning area. Research also tells us that silo thinking fosters so-called convergent thinking. Convergent thinking is the left one in this image where you see there is one, uh, there is one solution to a problem. So basically all the ideas focus on one solution. Whereas the opposite to that would be divergent thinking, where we start with a problem and then we throw up many, many different ideas. I want to invite you to think about what the problems we currently experience in the Anthropocene are like. They are very complex. Many of these problems have never existed before. Many of these problems need more than one solution. So what that means is Convergent thinking is a way of thinking that is traditional, but we need more solutions like that. And I'll just give you an example of that that's very uh, current. Just think of last year when the pandemic, the COVID pandemic raced across the world and countries were scrambling to develop vaccines. We could see that the problem was there, that was COVID. And then different countries and different companies and different researchers came up with lots of different ideas and different approaches. So we have now a range of vaccines and that's a good thing, right? Because we, as we can see, COVID's already developing. Right? It's already changing and we already have all these variants where 
older types of vaccines are already working no longer. So what we know is that 21st century design thinking, designing solutions to problems that haven't existed before the 21st century requires both. It requires divergent thinking, thinking in possibilities. And we need convergent thinking that um, allows people to arrive at one solution. This is a very important message that I want to convey to you when you teach in primary school, because this is the current generation that will be the most influential. They will be adults during the most crucial years that we have ahead of us, where we can either um, repair the world or we might burn it to a crisp. <laughs> So my visioning for primary education for sustainability in the 21st century is that we need to allow our students to pass on the ability to create creative solutions to the challenges of the Anthropocene that require both divergent and convergent thinking. We need, therefore, primary teachers who are both generalists and specialists, and especially in the science, mathematics, and the STEAM areas. So thank you very much. That was my contribution for today, and I'm looking forward to your questions in a little while. Thank you. Thank you, Ibulili, for giving such an informative presentation. Okay. Yeah, Ibu Lili mentioned about education for sustainability uh, and how it enables individuals and communities to reflect in ways of interpreting and engaging with the work, connect to ourselves, connect to the community, and connect to the work. I think all those things has its own impact. And don't worry, we will have more talks about it in the next session. Now we, we move to the second speaker, uh, Dr. Colin. Before we listen to her presentation, I will read her brief profile and I will share screen the CV. Wait a second. All right, okay, yeah. Dr. Colin Fletcher is an educator, consultant, and researcher. Dr. Colin has 23 years experience in education in Mozambique. Most recently, she was the secondary school principal of the American International School of Mozambique and the director of community partnership for the same school. In her time at the American International School, Dr. Cullen initiated and developed community arts programs, community schools programs, and worked consistently at connecting the curriculum to authentic and contextual experiences in Mozambique and in the region. Dr. Cullen served on international schools evaluation teams and has evaluated school programs and run teacher training programs in nine countries in Africa. Dr. Colin is also the co-founder of AVNH Consultants, focusing on education, teacher training, research and community development. All through the lens of respecting and leveraging indigenous knowledge system. In whole, her training, her focus is on authentic community and partnership building. And about the education, Dr. Colin holds a Bachelor of Education from Northwest University, South Africa, a master's in developing leadership skills in students from Buffalo State University, USA. 
and her doctoral thesis on partnership development in Mozambique is from the University of Liverpool, UK. Dr. Colin also received the Doctor of Education thesis of the year award. Well, knowing Dr. Colin is a practitioner, is made us believe that Dr. Colin will share an authentic and accurate strategies for facing threats and challenges for education implementation in 21st century related to her real experience. Okay, without waiting further, we kindly invite Dr. Colin for sharing the insight to all of us. Dr. Colin, the stage is yours. Goodness, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, first of all, for the absolute privilege to be here with you this afternoon for you, this morning for me. And also thank you very much, Lily, for sharing um, your very, very valuable presentation there. I was taking notes profusely um, because there's so many wonderful ideas to, to link up there as well. So thank you very much for creating this opportunity for us as all professionals to link, to, to connect. Um, if I may share my screen, I'd like to share my presentation. There we go. I see it is available. So um, what I would like to do is uh, my presentation is really to illustrate the value of context and community. And um, Dr. Lily spoke so beautifully about it. She said, it's not just about content that we teach. Um, it really is, what is that context in? What context is that in? And my personal passion is looking at the value of community. So um, I'm going to, throughout this presentation, uh, I'm going to just be sharing a lot of photographs that some of my colleagues have taken, some that I've taken, and artworks, so that I can just illustrate what I mean by authentically connecting the classroom to the context um, and community. So as um, Dr. Lily shared with us, our world is really quite challenged right now. And there is a big movement um, of how we can actually reset the world that, that we currently live in. Um, the World Economic Forum has got this program called Reset. What do we really look at? Um, but as you heard in the previous speaking, now we're really reaching this tipping point, can we make a difference? And it's not really, can we make a difference? It's yes, we have to make a difference. Who do we turn to? Turn to? We turn to absolutely everybody in the world to make a difference. But here's the thing as teachers, all of you in this seminar, in this webinar now, have chosen a profound profession, a most noble profession. And, but with that comes an incredible responsibility. And sometimes we can be totally overwhelmed by how am I going to do this? How am I actually going to make an impact? How am I going to make the necessary changes? So, so there's a picture of me and you can see that original painting on the back of my wall. I'll talk about that lovely painting in a little while. But you can look at the sustainable development goals, all 17 of them, and you can go, ah, what do I do? The world's about to fall apart. Or you can look at the sustainable development goals and you can go, oh, I'm a teacher. Here's an opportunity. What can I do? And this is the, the, the lens I want to move forward with. Those sustainable goals and those challenges that Dr. Lily also spoke about are not going to go away. They have to be addressed or else we will burn to a crisp. We as teachers are exposed to, as Dr. Lily said, not only the next generation, the current generations of change makers. And we have the responsibility to actually do something profound with our profession. All right, so we can use this as an opportunity. And I want you to look at the sustainable development goal number four, which is quality education. And quality education, maybe for our parents and in the past, meant, you know, you got the top grade, you went to the top universities. But quality education is so much broader than that now. And if you really look at all 17 sustainable development goals, without quality education, none of the others can happen. Because with quality education, 
We can empower individuals to look at number 14, look at life below the water. The beautiful example that Dr. Lidley just gave us of how to do keep how to develop sustainable oceans. Without quality education, we wouldn't be able to teach those lessons. Quality education actually leverages the opportunity for individuals to, to, to practice gender equality. Quality education is the fundamentals of um, promoting life on land, of promoting peace, promoting partnerships. So yes, we have to see this as sustainable development goals as our personal challenges. Yes, I can, we can do this. About the painting in the background, this lovely painting was done by a street artist here in Mozambique. And it just captures what I believe we as educators see every day and need, to, and need to harness. It's this lovely young girl just looking up into the light, the light full of hope. And she's in her eyes and she's looking up and she's saying, I want to make a change. I want to make a difference. And we as teachers have to actually facilitate that. So that's just the story behind the painting there. So yes, we can make a difference, but hold on. We've got to think a little bit deeper. We have to think a little bit deeper because it's not just about the content, it's not just about the sustainable development goals. And so when I think a little bit deeper, I think to myself, and Dr. Lily just spoke about this again, she spoke about divergent thinking and convergent thinking. We need to look at things differently and we need to think differently. For those of you who have actually been in the classroom, or you've done some practical teachers, or actually just look at your own group of students that you actually go into a class with. There's always one student that goes against the flow. Look at the bird in the middle over here. You've got all the students lined up and they're following what the program is. And there's always this one that's looking differently. It was doing something different. We need to think differently about those students. We need to think differently about those divergent thinkers, because you know what? This is a floating log in a river. And all those birds are facing one direction. One bird is facing, facing the other direction to look out and see if a crocodile is coming up to bite those birds. We need to embrace the different thinkers. We need to become different thinkers. So next time somebody goes against the grain or somebody's thinking differently, embrace that. Okay, so I'm going to look at, just share with you some of the people that I really enjoy. I, I, I visit their, their their blogs, their video tubes over and over again um, because they think differently and they, they have these pearls of wisdom that I draw on. And let me just remind you that I've been in the classroom and in schools until four months ago. Um, I, I have taught uh, right from kindergarten right through to 12th grade and I'm teaching. I, my primary school experience was as a fourth grade teacher and then I taught um, visual arts and performing arts from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. Um, and then in my administrative role as a school principal, obviously I got involved in teacher training um, in, in Mozambique and around, around Africa particularly. So in all my teaching, there's certain people I always fall back on and, and the wonderful Sir Ken Robinson is one of them because he really speaks about the need for creativity. He speaks about the need um, for cultural education. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this cultural education and contextual education. Um, he talks about comparing education to farming. And if we think about farming, farming is about preparing the soil so that you get a healthy plant. We've also had to rethink how we farm because at the turn of the last century, we got into the whole monocultural farming. We got into the whole way of thinking of, of yield and produce and how many thousands of tons can we get off one small hectare. And we introduced pesticides and chemicals. And what we did is, yes, we got this amazing yield, but we killed the soil. And so Ken Robinson talks about education in the same way. He says, yes, in the past, we focused on outcomes and we focused on how many A's and how many of our students got into the top universities and, and we still drive, drive, drive the yield. What were we doing to that individual while they were growing? Did we focus on the soil that the children were growing in? And the soil 
is that culture, is that context, it's where they come from. Um, just one or two of his amazing quotes that he speaks about here. He says, there is no system in the world or any school in the country that is better than its teachers. No pressure there to all you prospective teachers, <laughs> but you make the schools. You make the schools, you make the regions, you make education. Not the fancy buildings, those are fabulous and those are nice to have. But teachers, as he says, are the lifeblood of the success of the schools. And he says, just remember that what you do for yourself dies when you, with you when you leave this world and what you do for others lives on forever. And rest in peace, Sir Ken Robinson, he passed away um, of cancer last year. The other person that I often refer to is Dr. Tony Wagner, who actually, um, his focus was really on looking at businesses. So he's changed leadership and transformative education is his focus, but his focus comes from the business world. He was looking at um, what do people, when, when he looks at big, the Fortune 500 companies, um, he kept on hearing these complaints from the CEOs. That people are not coming into the workplace with the skills that they need. Schools are not preparing um, students with the, schools, uh, with the skills that they need for the 21st century. So he started looking at the gap. Um, and he, he wrote a book, the, the Global Achievement Gap, which is which is where he describes the seven survival skills of the 21st century. So while he was mostly looking at businesses and what school leavers, so 12th grade students, oopsie, my battery's running low, low so we just plug in. Um, so what he was looking at was this gap with what school leavers are leaving school with. Don't be fooled that that gap just happens in high school. We need to focus on building these skills that he refers to as the seven survival skills. You need to build these skills right from the word go in, in primary school. So he's talking about those critical thinkers and problem solvers. What Dr. Lively was talking about, the divergent thinking. He's talking about being collaborators and networkers. We can't learn alone. We have to do group learning. We have to support each other. He talks about agility and adaptability. So when things happen, change, shift gear. The pandemic is a wonderful example of that. First of all, we should have been more prepared. Were we prepared? The pandemic happened. We had to, scientists had to think on their feet. They had to do divergent thinking. They had to be agile and adaptable. Oh my gosh, and there's a new variant. They're constantly, those scientists are constantly still being agile and adaptive to meet the, the, the need right now. Students need to Give, be given the freedom and be given that soil where they can use their initiative and not be punished because they're thinking differently. There's certainly, in the 21st century, we need to be effective oral and written communicators. We need to be those communicators and effective. If you think about all the fake news and the false news that goes around with Instagrams and, and social media, we need to actually develop students who are effective accurate oral and written communicators. And that goes alongside, we need students that can access and analyze information, not just regurgitate information. And then most of all, and this is what Ken Robinson speaks about as well, is we need to actually foster curiosity and imagination. In fact, Ken Robinson says that we are born with curiosity. We are born as learners. And Dr. Lilly spoke about that as we go up through the grades, somehow that curiosity and that imagination disappears because standardized testing, standardized testing and yield actually takes, takes, um, takes precedence. So we need to foster these seven, and this is what uh, Tony Wagner says, are the seven survival skills for the 21st century. Professor John Hattie from Australia has actually conducted um, many, but in his, his first, what brought him out to the world of educators is doing his more than 800 meta studies on achievement. What creates, what impacts achievement? And he has a list and you can go and look on, on his website. He has a list of 138 influences on achievement. Um, and in his book, Visible Thinking, he, uh, Visible Learning, he talks about what are the most important things that we need to teach students or what do we need to facilitate? Learning how to learn, 
And with that means getting regular feedback, informative assessment, not the summative task, not the end result only, that regular feedback along the way. He talks about the, the positive impact of small groups. He talks about the positive impact of discussions. And he talks about the positive impact of, um, of teacher clarity. And if you look at that diagram on the left-hand side there, one of the biggest impacts that he, that he says, one of the most positive impacts on learning is that teacher-student relationship. So we're getting back to people. The fourth person I want to make reference to is not in education directly, but instead is an environmentalist. Um, and Wangari Mutai, who sadly has also passed on, uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. For what? For peace? You know how she created peace? She developed the Green Belt Movement where she taught communities to plant trees. She realized that the poverty in communities was directly related to the poverty of the soil, to erosion, to the fact that they couldn't get their yield of crops anymore. And so she started a movement where communities would plant trees to actually fertilize that soil again, to, to reinvigorate soils so that they could actually improve their own crops. And in so doing, she drew many communities out of the brink of starvation. And by doing that, that led to less conflict, less pressure on land and led to peace. And she says, the real thing is when you dig a hole, plant a tree, give it water and make it survive, that's what makes a difference. Now, if I had to say, if that was an analogy for education, the real thing is when you dig that hole, when you've got that student, and when you dig that hole, you put the compost in it, you plant the tree, the student, you give it water, you help it survive, that is what's going to make the difference. And most profound there, and this is directly linked to what um, Dr. Lilly was talking was about, where she says in a few decades, the relationship between the environment, resources, and conflict may seem as obvious as the connection we see today between human rights, democracy, and peace. So let me just stop there for a minute. And um, what am I actually talking about here? So if you take the, the nuggets of information that I've given you from these four people who are quite profound in their field, who are profound in their fields and, and are my go-to people quite often. They're not talking about access to technology. That's a nice to have. They're not talking about a fancy building or school building. Those are fantastic and they're great and they do make things easier. But they're talking about the fundamental thing for a student, for a child to learn is that they need that good earth, that good soil, that good security. And how do you get that? You get that in communities. You get that from communities. So for me, as I, in my experience, I have seen that the breakdown of community is often a real cause for concern in how any person and any student can thrive. This photograph was taken in the northern parts of Mozambique in Cabal Delgado, and as a result of conflict that is un ongoing right now, there are more than 800,000 people who are displaced, most of them children. Now, when you have displaced peoples, they lose community. And when you have children that are displaced, they lose their normality. And one of the normalities for children is going to school, because going to school has a classroom and that classroom is their community. That classroom is their community of learners. So displaced peoples have lost not only their families, not only their wider communities, but they've lost, lost, lost their community of learning as well. Despite that, I just think that this picture is so hopeful because again, they're these happy faces. Because why? They're together. They're a group of kids that are together they are creating and reinventing their own community. So for me, one of the biggest and fundamental um, flaws that we have and challenges that we have is this lack of community. So what do we do then? Um, let's, let's just go back very briefly. And the background is a drawing of a community tree. I, I'm fortunate to 
uh, enough to live on a farm just north of Maputo. Um, and I'm surrounded by rural communities and I work very closely with one of the communities called the Sibakusi community. And this is the community tree. Uh, particularly where women sit under and they pass on stories and they plan and the leaders plan and that is their community tree. So if we go back and speak and see what the others have spoken about community, Ken Robinson says in order for us to flourish we needed communities that are demonstrate bravery and imagination. Um, Tony Wagner says community Choice in learning, and Dr. Lily spoke about that again, that primary school children need to have choice and voice. So community choice and voice are tools that enable young people to begin to make meaning and find purpose in the world that seemingly has gone mad. Critical, so when you're in that classroom, give those children choice, give them voice to actually develop the confidence that they can take risks. Giving choice and voice is nurturing the soil that they can grow in. John Tatty speaks about a community of teachers and speaks of the value of collective teachers' efficacy. As teachers, you cannot do it alone. You cannot. As humans, we cannot do it alone. So when you collect a group of teachers, particularly across different subjects, um, and you integrate the passions and the interests, that's when real magic happens for learning, that collective teacher efficacy. And Wangari Matai says that nobody in the world is completely dependent on another person. That's true, but we are all interdependent. So, obviously, my absolute hero from this region, and I hope this one minute video will play, um, is that Nelson Mandela said, coined or the, the term Ubuntu has been around forever, but Nelson Mandela speaks about Ubuntu. And he says, Ubuntu means I am because we are. And I've just had a little flash on my screen that says my internet might be a bit unstable. So I'm not going to share this video, but I'm assuming that the, the, the slides can be shared with everybody. And then you're welcome to actually have a look at this. But Nelson Mandela says here that Ubuntu one of the things, uh, one of the characteristics of Ubuntu is in the old days, when people lived in villages and a traveler was walking from one village to the next, he did not have to ask for water. He did not have to ask to sit under the shade of a tree. That would be what the community would do. They would come and give him water. They would say, sit under the tree, rest a while before you move on. I am because we are collectively. So, uh, probably not going to be stable enough. Okay, so we have to though, in order to think about community, we have to always go back and say, well, who am I? We have to understand our own context. Before we think to connect with anybody else, we need to understand ourselves first, because knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom, says Aristotle. And then we must gain as much knowledge about the others and the context we find ourselves in. This beautiful painting was done by Gustav Klimt in 1909, and it is his, it's a part of a massive painting, which is the Tree of Life. And it's just full of beautiful swirls and symbols and that you can interpret in any way of what those symbols might have meant in his life. So while I go through the next slides, it would be lovely if you had pen and paper next to you. And you just drew your own tree of life and your swirls and filled in some symbols. And this is a great exercise to do with students in a class as well. Let them draw their tree of life while you're talking because you'll find it incredible how they are actually adding little symbols as you talk or adding ideas of what sparks on a new idea. It's not a distraction. It's actually honing, honing everybody in to be taking what you're hearing and actually transforming it into something that is personal. So please feel free to draw your own tree of life as I go through the next few steps. Um, I want to just take this one moment to just share a little bit more about my context. As I said, I live on a farm just north of Maputo. Um, I left formal education to actually form a consultancy and the focus of my consultancy is working with teachers and working with schools and working with organizations so that they can authentically connect what they are doing in classrooms to the context where they're in. 
So if you're learning something in the classroom, how do you take that into the context of Mozambique particularly? I had 23 years of experience of working with international schools. And too often we find that students in international schools live in a bubble um, and don't really, really know what's going on outside of that bubble. In fact, many of us who are privileged enough to go to a good school or to school with facilities can easily fall into that bubble. So my focus is trying to get people outside of the classroom, beyond the four walls, and getting into the context. So I live in rural Mozambique. These are women of the Sibakusi community who dance and celebrate. That's the community tree there um, at, any, at any opportunity. Um, and this is a beautiful poem that I'll read for you, which to me sums up the birth of Africa. It comes from an incredible book called um, Indaba My Children, which is a collection of folk tales um, of all over Africa. But this is how many um, traditional uh, African cultures actually interpret the birth of Africa. No stars were there, no sun, neither moon nor earth. Nothing existed but darkness itself, darkness everywhere. Nothing existed but nothingness, a nothingness neither hot nor cold, dead or alive, a nothingness far worse than nothing and frightening in its utter nothingness. For how long this nothingness lasted, no one will ever know. And then upon the invisible waters of time, that mighty river that neither source nor mouth, which was, which is, and ever shall be, on that day, or is it right, right to say it? one day? The river time desired nothingness. And as a result of the strangest marriage of time and nothingness, a most tiny, nigh invisible spark of living fire was born. And many say that is what was the birth of Africa. But I want to see that as the birth of knowledge. You as teachers will have children in your class that sometimes are bewildered. We don't know what's going on in their lives and their communities back home. There might appear to be nothingness, but give them time. Take that, give it time. And when you marry the time and the overwhelming and the bewilderedness and what appears to be nothingness, there'll be a tiny spark and it's up to you to spur on that spark. So on that note, I'm going to very quickly give you some top 10 tips that I found really made a difference um, in teaching. And this is appropriate for all ages. Uh, this is a lovely picture of one of our students. She was in 10th grade at the time. She came out to visit the Sibikusi community. And as many of you know, women collect water. They don't have running water in their homes. They collect water from a, a, a nearby pump or tap. It's also the place where the women get together and build their community of women, sharing stories, sharing traditions. Um, and, and, and I was just so happy to try and carry the water on her head. It was a moment of transformation for her when she realized in the mornings that she just turns the tap on and it's running, somebody else at that same moment is carrying water on their head to go and take it to their families to feed them. Um, so here's some top 10 tips. Oopsie, that one rushed ahead. So first of all, effective teachers know and acknowledge their roots and where they come from. They know who they are and they celebrate who they are. Secondly, effective teachers build classroom communities because often that is the community that the child needs. Always thriving for the sun. There we go. That is the community. It might be the only source of community that the student has. So they build classroom communities where the child feels trust, trusted, feels validated, and has that soil to grow, can be innovative, can think differently and not be punished for thinking differently. Effective teachers create con those conditions where they can flourish, okay? And Ken Robinson says again, people flourish when the culture is right. So we recognize and embrace the diversity. We acknowledge, respect, and value each student's roots and where they come from. And we focus on compassion, empathy, and collaboration. That is creating that condition where students can flourish, not just live, but flourish. This photograph was taken by, um, again, in a, a school very close to me. 
where the students had come out to actually build a classroom. And I think this picture of looking through a window um, just captures that, that idea of looking at life through a different perspective and being curious and interested in this. Those students were grade 9, 10, 11, and 12 age group. Um, effective teachers tell stories. And they let others tell their stories because storytelling is what we're all about as humans. Uh, this photograph is I, I bring students out for weekends, not only to do community builds, but to listen to the, the folk tales from, from people living in this area. And that is just a group of students sitting around a campfire listening to folk tales told by the people in this area. <laughs> Um, effective teachers authentically connect the learning in the classroom to the context of where their student is. You leverage the indigenous knowledge systems that are around there and you connect it to what you are learning. This is a photograph again under the, the community tree by one of the Sibakusi women who um, was demonstrating to the students how to actually crush the corn and make traditional food. They then later made their own traditional food and ate um, and, and joined in a meal together. So authentically connecting food, food systems, they were learning about food systems um, at school, the sciences. And so we brought it out, we brought them out here for the for the day and they actually went into the field, they harvested some of the food, they crushed the corn, they made the porridge, they ate it. And so they compared the food systems um, that they were learning about in class to this. I want to just very quickly drop in a note about the concept of average. In the 1950s, the US Air Force decided that, you know what, we need to actually create an average size cockpit for our fighter planes because um, some pilots are tall and short. So let's just work out what the average is, average size of a pilot is, and then we'll form a cockpit that is it, and then all the pilots will be actually quite comfortable in their fighter jets. Well. They took 10 dimensions of 400 pilots to try and find the average pilot size. Guess what? There's no such thing as an average pilot size. There's no such thing. So what, and what happened then is they had to develop the adjustable seat, just as you have when you drive your car today and you can adjust the seat that actually came from this study where, okay, we couldn't do an average uh, cockpit size, but we can do something to the seat to adjust it. So what this highlights though is there's no such thing as average. We have to be very careful about always comparing each student to some norms and some means and some averages. Be careful of that because it's the one that is outside of that curve that is really going to surprise us and make the big changes that we need in this world. Effective teachers recognize that learning is a natural process. We love to learn. Humans are innately curious and creative. We need to leverage that. This was actually a group of four-year-olds that were learning about travel and we're learning about maps and um, so because we couldn't for safety reasons we couldn't take the four-year-olds off campus we actually did a safari on campus they combined all the subjects we integrated the arts in in art they made a pair of binoculars um, they chose fabric as their headbands they identified animal spur and we made spur around the, the school grounds. And then they went on safari to go um, and identify the different animal spur that they could find and follow a map that they had developed to find the animals as well. Effective teachers make the connection. This is really, really important. Effective teachers make the connection between students' aspirations and passions and what the teacher delivers. So your, your students aspire to something and then we need to meet them with their aspirations. We can't fall short of what the students' aspirations are. Effective teachers are passionate to do that. This was a group of students that are a little bit older. These were five-year-olds, five and six-year-olds that we could actually take off campus and we took them to some wetlands. And, and this was a learning curve for, for us as teachers. We had all these activities planned and we were going to spend, you know, cost different animal prints and we, and what happened? They saw tadpoles and they were fixated on tadpoles for the entire morning. But that's when you, you adapt, you change and you go, right, all the learning that we're going to do is going to be focused on tadpoles because that was the best. That was what they were fixated on. It was a delightful day. Um, effective teachers integrate the subjects. 
uh, Dr. Lilly spoke about STEAM and cross-curricular. Uh, the arts and the sciences always work together because that's how the world works. Beautifully designed bridges are artistic as well as structurally sound. Um, with the Cabo Delgado, uh, problems that we have up north. We actually did a school drive as well. So the picture on the right there is a combination of drama students, art students, and the humanities class where they did a drive to collect foods to send up to the displaced peoples. Um, and we didn't just make the posters. From a performance point of view, we then did a march. We did like a protest march around campus. Um, it was a pandemic, so we could only do it around campus for their fellow students um, to, to bring awareness to that. The picture on the left hand side is the design technology class. Um, we're designing bridges, but we started off with an activity on, on how to, to get a group of students across a fictitious crocodile infested river using logs and strings. It was just a really great provocation to an integrated um, course on uh, integrated unit on bridge building. Community gardens is also just a lovely combination of the, um, the arts and the science. Okay, and then finally, and most importantly, effective teachers reflect. They reflect on themselves as human beings. They reflect on the impact that they've had on students. They reflect on the impact that they've had on the world and they reflect, reflect on the impact on community. So finally, if we go back to those SDGs, it may seem overwhelming, one other quick tool that I'd love to introduce you to, and you can go to compasseducation.org. If we took all those sustainable development goals and you actually put them onto a compass point, where North stands for nature, E stands for economy, S stands for society, and W stands for well-being, you'll see that all the sustainability goals actually fall loosely into those four areas on the compass. Now, if you took your classroom and you created a community in your classroom, Every time you do an activity, every time you do an activity or a project or a unit, you could say to yourself, hmm, what I'm doing here, is this focusing on justice and peace? Is it focusing on reducing in inequality? Is it focusing on quality education or water and sanitation or energy or inclusive growth? And by looking at that, and just having it in the back of your mind as you develop units of study or classroom experiences, you are addressing the sustainable development goals and you are making a difference and you are reaching many, many children. And that is it from me. Remember, teachers Ubuntu, this is what Nelson Mandela says, I am because we are we are the connectors that through our teaching make an impact on the world. So go out there, connect, collaborate, create cultures, and make a positive change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Dr. Colin Fletcher for the inspiring presentation. Now we go to the last speakers of our webinar today, that is Mr. Kusayari MPG. Uh, and I will read a little of the curriculum we gave about Mr. Kusayari. Okay. Okay, Mr. Kosari, time is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for all presentation uh, all participants. Uh, in this evening, I would like to talk about uh, how aligning learning evaluation with national assessment policy. Uh, Let me share uh, 
my PowerPoint. Oke, okay, Mbak Sinta, can you see? Oke, okay. uh, why uh, I talk this a topic? Uh, because Indonesian government has made various innovation in the educational system, including the national examination, which has been changed to the national assessment known uh, the minimum competency. We call uh, assessment competency minimum. The national assessment uh, assessment competency minimum take a holistic view of learning and teaching, measuring both a cognitive and affective outcome, as well as the quality of the learning environment. All participants, hopefully this presentation will act as a springboard for discussion. Please uh, look at this slide. In this slide, uh, we uh, show you how assessment reform around the world. Why? Because no day there is no country in the world without a system of formal examination. According to Broadfoot, educational assessment is truly international phenomenon, such as in USA, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia. The first the assessment reform in USA and uh, uh, Australia, US and Australia use standardized examination as a policy instrument to reform their education. Uh, United States or uh, US uh, use the NCLB, No Child Left Behind, has become a tool to evaluating the quality of schools in US. And this is bringing major consequences for school that are considered failing. As uh, Dr. Lily say, Australia use a NAPLAN to enforce process standard and learning outcome that initially varied between uh, states. So, uh, from empirical evidence from Singapore, Hong Kong, and China, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and China encourage more innovative classroom assessment. They were driven by the awareness of the strong of the standardized test, which can hinder uh, teaching and learning practice being the demand of 21st century com competencies, like uh, Dr. Uh, Colin Sai. We have identified three potential unintended large-scale testing uh, like uh, USA, Australia, and Indonesia use a uh, national examination. Uh, first, teachers and school often default uh, this more time and resources to teach subject and content that are tested. And secondly, a potential unintended large scale testing, a promotion of 
dishonest behavior. When assessment is tied to consequences associated with uh, students, teachers, schools, and principal career, there is a large pressure to engage in dishonest behavior. And finally, uh, potential unintended is, is a distortion of teaching uh, practice. Yeah. The higher the stakes, testing can distort teaching because encouraging the use of appropriate which are narrowly aimed to prepare students to perform um, tests. And uh, national assessment, so the national assessment aim to create an assessment system will try positive change in teaching practice and student learning while minimizing unintended consequences of large-scale testing. We have assessment, from assessment we have information, to uh, <clears throat> learning quality and outcome. And the national assessment the national assessment uh, will measure key learning outcome and the quality of learning environment. Student uh, sorry Student, uh, student reading and numeracy literacy. We have uh, reading literacy and numeracy literacy for assessment competency minimum. Measure using tests which are designed to target higher order cognitive competence rather than knowledge of curricular content. We have to uh, measure character survey. The character survey, the survey character will assess six character, which describe the qualities of the ideal Indonesian student. We say in a bahasa, profil pelajar Pancasila Indonesia, the ideal Indonesian student profile consists of virtuous character atau kita namai dengan akhlak mulia critical thinking like uh, Dr. Khalid said creativity self regulation social collaboration gotong royong in Indonesia and global multikulturalism atau kebinekaan in Indonesia or in bahasa also, we uh, <clears throat> assess learning environment survey. So, the minimum competency assessment consists of reading literacy and numeracy literacy. Reading literacy is the ability to understand use, evaluate, reflect, and various types of written text to develop individual capacities as Indonesian and global citizen and contribute it productively to society. And numeracy literacy is the ability to think uh, using concept, procedures, facts, and mathematical tool to solve daily problem in various types of contexts which are relevant for individual uh, for individual as citizens of Indonesia and the world. So the numerical numeracy literacy is a different with uh, mathematics. Numeracy literacy approach, uh, more approach, uh, and 
and reading literacy component uh, we have three component of reading literacy content context and cognitive level content in reading literacy consists of literary text and information text in the literary text students can get entertainment enjoy stories and reflect on problem of life that the author has to offer and information tech students can obtain fact data and information to develop scientific insight and knowledge this is a content of reading literacy after that we have uh, three cognitive process in the reading literacy retrieve and assess interpret and integrate evaluate and reflect i will uh, keep explain this cognitive process in the uh, next slide after uh, this slide and <clears throat> contact in the reading uh, literacy we have uh, three contacts personal social cultural and scientific personal contact this content even setting action character atmosphere feeling ideas and insight that are personal students are expected to have reading literacy skill to shape their character by exploring critical and creative thinking skill in personal life in the social cultural content contain reflection of people views regarding socio cultural condition in this context students are expected to be able to recognize and understand socio cultural condition and symptom inside and outside the global community and the scientific context contains space science medical science drug nutrition physics weather climate natural phenomena biological scientific and so on related to science and technology in this context students are expected to understand knowledge related to science problem and reflect on various important information that has been obtained to participate in the science and technology environment in the numeracy literacy also uh, have three component context content and lef uh, level cognitive in the context we have three contexts personal social cultural and scientific uh, in numeracy literacy this personal contact focuses on the activities of a person family of group in the sociocultural this context related to community problem whether local or regional national or global problem and the uh, scientific contact this contact related with the application of mathematics in practical activities and the issues related to science and technology 
and uh, cognitive level this different from uh, <coughs> literacy reading literacy we have three cognitive level two first is knowing like in uh, second applying and three reasoning and finally we have uh, content in numeracy literacy uh, consists of four content number geometry and measurement algebra and data and uncertainty I think uh, this is all of my presentation, and I will give an explain, an explain, an example letter after this uh, presentation. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullah wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for Mr. Kusairi MPD for delivering such informative presentation. As we know that it's about basic assessment in Indonesia and of course uh, in the world as well. And now we, uh, I have to read some of the curriculum today about Mr. Kusairi. So, uh, Mr. Kusairi is one of the lecturer in University of Universitas Islam Sunan Ampel Surabaya. That is one of the uh, university in Indonesia, and we so glad to have him with us here as a as one of our speaker today. And uh, I think. That's all for the curriculum today. Now we uh, we already have some questions in the column session, but before I read the questions, now for everyone who the participant who want to direct questions for the speakers, please uh, use the Price hand feature and open camera so we can know. And uh, you can tell us about your questions. Okay, Miss Sinta, can you hear my voice? Me. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for taking over the session. Oh, and for, <laughs> fortunately, you know, the electricity, the electricity is on in my home. I'm, I'm really sorry for the inconveniences. I have a trouble in the electrical problem here. And now, yeah, we are ready and I'm back. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ms. Sinta. And now, as Ms. Sinta already mentioned before, we are leading to a Q&A session with all three speakers. Uh, 
beside the written question, we also have direct question from the audience. So for all the audience who wants to interact directly with the speakers today, we are pleased you to just click the hand raise button on your Zoom. Then you can, then the camera can, the, the comedy can spotlight the camera on you and then you can deliver the question directly. Okay, um, maybe the comedy can help me to find who is the lucky one can deliver the question directly to the speaker today. So has anyone raised hand? Still waiting. Okay, maybe while we wait for direct question, we can move to the written question. Okay, I will I try to check it in the chat room on Zoom. Maybe we can start from Zoom. Yeah, we have a question here from our speaker. <laughs> Okay, uh, maybe I can I can try to select the question. Okay, maybe maybe we can start from mm -hmm. Miss Lily, Doctor Lily. You have a question here. You write a question. Sustainable development education is different than education. What is your opinion? Yes, I to have whom this to... question. Okay. I have tried to answer it earlier in the chat. <laughs> Basically, what I, what I have been saying mm -hmm. is that, yes, they are different because sustainability education is more content uh -huh. focused. It basically um, assumes that when you teach students all the right contents, that that will automatically change their attitudes and their values and their perspectives. And it will automatically lead to action. Education for sustainability does not assume that. It thinks that uh, we need to actively teach um, values and worldviews, or rather we need to actively give opportunities for learning for values and uh, worldviews to our students through, for example, ethical dilemma story pedagogy that I'd spoken about earlier. Okay. I hope this answers your question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a question exactly for you from uh, Pat Ganes. Yeah. He's one of the lecturer in our department. And yeah, I hope the question already answered by uh, Dr. Lily, or maybe for Dr. Colin and Professor explanation regarding the, regarding the question. Or just enough, no additional information needed. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just coming in there for a little bit late. Um, I just, you know, confer with Dr. Lilly that uh, sustainable development education is is different from sustainable sustainability education, and it is what what Dr. Lilly was talking about is that sustainability is is about it goes beyond content. Sustainability goes beyond content. It's the it's the care. It's the it's taking action across across content. Um, it, it's the empathy, it's the awareness, it's the care. It's those soft skills, actually. Um, and using those soft skills with the content that you've been taught to actually then implement solutions that are sustainable. So it, it goes beyond content.
Okay, I think the internet here is, is unstable. Uh, hopefully now work working well. Um, yeah, I will continue for the Q&A for the written question. Uh, maybe I will sh share screen it. Then everyone can have a look at the question. Okay, oh, wait a minute. Okay, for the question, here is the question, yeah. Uh, yeah, before we just uh, answered for uh, the first question and now we move to the second question. Okay, uh, the question is from uh, Miss Irana Mauren and this question is for uh, Dr. Collett. So the question is, effective teachers tell stories. However, preparing storytelling in the classroom takes time or to be able to tell a good story takes time. Any further tips or ideas about this? Dr. Collett, please. Yes, thank you. Um, that's a great question uh, because I think what one has to highlight here is that this is not uh, telling stories from a storybook. What I mean by telling stories is telling your own experiences. So when you as a teacher are delivering any kind of content related to a story or experience where you have actually used the content or seen it. Um, that lovely example that Dr. Lily did about sustainable oceans, you know, during that unit. As a teacher, you might tell a story of when you went to the beach, of how you swam in the waves and the water was so clean. And you tell the story of how, oh my goodness, a piece of plastic washed up and how disappointing that was. That's what I mean by telling stories. It does take time, but if you think more about telling stories as having conversations. And remember when you were a young child and you would visit grandparents, if you were fortunate to have grandparents around and you would just sit in their space and they would just talk and have a conversation. That's really what I mean by telling stories stories, we have those natural conversations with the students relating what they're learning to something that you've experienced. And what it does is it provokes the, the student then to say, oh, I know, I know, once I went here and I went there, and it does take time. But the more we tell stories, the more the learning happens, the more the transformation of the information happens in the child's mind as well. But thanks for that question. That's a really great, uh, important to clarify um, the type of storytelling that I was referring to. Okay, thank you, Dr. Colin. Ms. Irena, would you like to give your response regarding the answer? Hello, Ms. Irena. Could you please turn on your microphone, then maybe you can discuss something with Dr. Colin. Okay, okay. Maybe <laughs> Dr. Irina going somewhere or doing some activity. Oh, by the way, thank you so much for your answer, Dr. Colin. And for the second question, again, for you. <laughs> From Pak Ganes Gunansha. Uh, the question is, the concept of SDGs and MDGs have been criticized for their ambivalence. Overlap between goals and growth orientation. What is your opinion? Dr. Cullen, please. Right, thank you. And I did try and answer that as well in the chat. Um, and yes, there is a lot of criticizing uh, criticism of the MDGs and the SDGs. I don't focus on that. If we look at the titles of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, they're real. There is poverty. There is a problem with water. There is inequality. I focus on what they are. And then I go back to my context and my sphere of influence. And the action I take has to be that I know that whatever action I'm going to take within my sphere of influence is actually going to promote a positive way of thinking or process of solution to that so i don't get caught up in in um the semantics or the or, or the way they've been designed i know just by looking at those 17 titles and in the context that i live in there are in my face inequality lack of sanitary uh, clean water poverty sustainable food systems those are real and i just focus on that okay 
Thank you, Dr. Colin, for the answer. And I invite me, I, I kindly invite the Paganis. Would you like to say something or maybe interact or discuss something with the speaker, Dr. Colin? So, no, no response from Pak Ganes. Okay, okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Colin, for your answer. And now we have the other written question. Maybe I will share screen again here. Okay, for the, the other question, okay. Well, this question from uh, Miss Nani Mariana to Professor Dr. Kusairi. The question is regarding our national assessment goals in literacy and building good citizenship. Do you have any idea how to connect this to achieve the goal of education for sustainability or for learning community? Professor Kusairi. Okay, Mrs. Zafira. I will uh, answer this question uh, in Bahasa. Please help me. Help me please to uh, deliver in English. Miss Safira, you heard okay. me? Okay. Yeah, uh, I can hear you. Okay. Terkait kebijakan a national assessment atau uh, assessment nasional, Ini memang sangat terkait dengan bagaimana uh, SDG ya, jadi uh, Sustainability Development Goal. Jadi kita ingin mengarahkan ke sana supaya warga negara Indonesia menjadi tidak ketinggalan dengan warga dunia. Jadi kalau tadi membaca di literasi numerasi, saya share lagi. Uh, Jadi ini untuk mengarahkan warga negara Indonesia sebagai individu yang memiliki kapasitas dan uh, kemampuan yang uh, global ya, yang, yang global, baik di literasi membaca maupun di literasi numerasi. Nah, arahnya tentu ke sustainability uh, development goal. Silakan, uh, Miss Safira. Miss Safira. Sinta, please, to deliver in English. Thank you very much, Mr. Kosari, for the uh, answer for the questions maybe uh, because this question is not only for Mr. Kosairi so uh, I please for the Mrs. Lily and Mrs. Kulin to answer the question as well maybe from the side of the approved side yeah I'm happy to to give my opinion on that um I, I must be honest that i was really inspired to see the the layout and the format of uh, format of the assessment um and because i sort of lean towards the humanities and to the literature literacies and the arts 
um, I really wanted to look and see how mathematical, uh, you know, uh, the, the numeracy lit literacy was actually going to evaluate real issues. Um, and for me, in terms of community and social cultural issues. And so I was really, really happy to see the context of social cultural issues being built into everything. Um, on the one side where you've got the numeracy literacy components, the context of it, you actually have the social cultural um, element there where it says the context relates to community problems. Um, and I was like, whoa, yes, yes. Work with mathematics, work with mathematic literacy in alignment with what the problems are of the day, what the problems are in communities. Um, and it says whether local, regional and global. And so for me as a teacher, I would get excited going, I can connect this authentically to my communities right here where I live. So I, I think they, um, it's refreshing to see the way it is laid out. Okay, so I would just like to add from the Australian perspective, um, I was talking about NAPLAN testing before, which is basically numeracy and literacy based testing. There is some science that's being tested in there. And, you know, when, when I heard you speak about, you know, the um, bringing citizenship into, you know, the assessment process that filled me with great hope. Because what's happening in Australia is that because the focus is on mathematics, on literacy, and on, you know, science assessment, the other parts of the curriculum are a little bit falling by the wayside. And there is quite a bit of research now that shows that teachers are spending a lot of time to teach to the test, meaning that they are preparing their students exclusively to do well in those tests, which basically means that a lot of other things are not being taught, just simply so that the test the students will do well in the test and the school will look good in, um, uh, yeah, in basically the compared assessments across the state. So there are, and across the country really. So this is a serious issue where testing leads to league tables that um, negatively affect what is being taught in schools. So rather than enhancing quality, there is um, there are some considerations that it's actually led to the opposite. Thank you very much, Mrs. Colleen and Mrs. Lily for the wonderful and supportive questions. And we know that uh, that's a gap that really fit in our assessment, but we complete, complete each other. So uh, uh, first of all, I'm, uh, I'm also say sorry for our error in the uh, webinar today because uh, Mrs. Mrs. Zafira have some problem with the internet. And now I hand over again to the Mrs. Zafira. Can you hand over? Uh, Mrs. Avera, sorry, the microphone is off. Hey, sorry, sorry, I'm back here again. Thank you so much. And yeah, uh, do we have another question or do we still have a time for a Q&A session? Is my voice clear enough or? Okay. Okay, enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe we have another question in YouTube about but how, how can I access the question? Uh, maybe the committee, could you please help me to find the question on YouTube? Okay. We have it on 
Okay, wait, wait a minute. Uh, right. Yeah, we have another question, but I still don't load it. Then, yeah, now we open it. Another question from the participant. Yes, we have two other question. Now maybe I can share screen, then everyone can read it. Share screen, okay. Yeah, for another question here. Yes, the question from Mangara Pitan to Professor Dr. Kusairi. There are sometimes a gap between cultural context and the direction of actual curriculum headed to. In this case, should we transform the culture or the curriculum? Uh, Professor Kusairi, can you hear my voice? Okay, Ms. Fira. Yeah. I will uh, answer this question. Help me please to translate in English, please, Ms. Safira. Yes. Okay. Uh, Pak Manggara Pinton. Jadi konteks sosial, konteks budaya di dalam assessment uh, di dalam assessment ini dimaksudkan sebagai bagaimana anak kalau saya uh, izin share screen lagi, oh, izin share screen lagi. Mbak. Oh sure, I Mbak can Pira. stop share, ya. Yeah. Yeah. Jadi di dua literasi baik uh, numerasi maupun uh, membaca yang dimaksud dengan konteks kultural, sosial kultural ini adalah bagaimana anak diharapkan mampu mengenal uh, dan memahami kondisi lingkungan sekitarnya. Jadi bagaimana misalkan kalau di literasi membaca kita sajikan teks, kegiatan-kegiatan kemasyarakatan, kegiatan-kegiatan yang ada di lingkungan uh, sekitarnya, di lingkungan sekolah, Nah, ini yang dimaksud, sehingga nanti akan tertanam dengan uh, kebinekaan Indonesia. Jadi bagaimana dia berinteraksi dengan uh, teman yang berbeda agama, teman yang berbeda pendapat, dan teman yang berbeda apapun. Nah ini diharapkan akan muncul toleransi kesadaran-kesadaran lain yang uh, mengikuti dari uh, sosial kultural ini. Nah dalam konteks ini, uh, kekhawatiran terkait dengan bagaimana nantinya benturan dengan kurikulum, maka sekarang sedang uji kurikulum, jadi uji publik kurikulum di kementerian, mudah-mudahan ini memang kita selaraskan antara konteks assessment dengan konteks kurikulum. Ya. Jadi mudah-mudahan di akhir Desember 2021 ini, apa yang sudah kita hasilkan di konteks kurikulum yang dikhawatirkan tadi tidak bertentangan dengan konteks sosio-kultural di assessment. Itu kira-kira, Miss Zafira. Ya. Yeah. Okay, for... I forgot the name. Maybe I can go show it, like, say it from the PowerPoint. Mr. Mangara, right? Yeah, are you there, Mr. Mangara? Oh, no, maybe the microphone is off. Okay, based on the uh, Professor Kusairi said that the cultural context in assessment uh, is like a cure for the students. And literacy and numeracy uh, seems that uh, as a tool to see how the students can acknowledge, acknowledge their environment, then uh, the hope is it can be embedded with the Indonesian culture like tolerance. 
And in this context, uh, for the curriculum, now it's still in the in the like a validity test or something like that. And hope what the Mr. Mangara's worry about will not be happen. Uh, but for the result, we might see for uh, I don't know, maybe not now. Maybe after they uh, finish the validity test, uh, then they might know uh, how. Uh, the result might work well or not. Yeah, maybe that's the answer. And now maybe we move to the the other question. Maybe I can share screen again. Then we can know the other question or. Oh. Have I shared screen the question? Has the file showed on the screen? Maybe something happened. I don't know, trouble again or not? It's uh, blue moon Okay. Still work, maybe? Didn't work. Didn't work. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll try to show it on the screen. Okay. Or maybe I can read it directly from the chat room. Yes, please, ma'am. Okay. So the question, oh, here again, we got it, wait a minute. I have, I got the message from the committee for the question, wait a minute, uh, okay. Open file, open file, okay, oh, okay, there. Wait a minute. I have to share screen. Share screen, share screen. Okay. I need to... Okay. God. Okay. Now, has the file showed on the screen? Yes, it has. No, I can see it. Okay, okay, thank you. And now the question from Aristia to Miss Lily. It has been explained that in Australia, the education system has specialized in science childhood. Science since childhood. Is there any case when a child becomes an adult that he has any interest in other in other specialties than he had previously chosen, and how to overcome that? Okay. okay I, think, I think there's a, a misunderstanding. What I was saying was that teacher education students in their fourth year, their last year of their studies, choose a specialization, not the primary students. Okay. So what this means is that um, our primary teachers graduate with a specialization. Okay. So what that means is that, unfortunately, what it leads to is that in many schools, um, primary teachers, because they don't feel confident teaching science, leave all the science teaching to teachers who have specialized in science. And what this does is it basically separates science from the rest of the curriculum, rather than having one teacher teach a generalist curriculum. So I think there was a bit of a misunderstanding. I was not talking about the children. I was talking about the pre-service teachers. 
about to graduate. I hope this answers your question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lily. Maybe Dr. Colin, would you like to add some explanation regarding the answer? Uh, no, that I think was very specific or to- Or maybe have the another session. answer for the question. <laughs> Okay. I, th I think that was very specific to the context of Dr. Lily. So no, I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I got a message from the committee for the answer, the question from Mangara Pitan. Uh, would you like for the other uh, two speaker for Dr. Lily and Dr. Colin? Would you like to answer the question uh, from Mangara Pitan? that I read before. Maybe I can reread re it again. again. Mm -hmm. uh, the question that was the is, question about culture, yes. The question is, there are sometimes a gap between cultural context and the direction of actual curriculum headed to. In this case, should we transform the culture or the curriculum? Okay. Um, it, it's a tricky question. But I mean, my, my knee jerk reaction is you can't transform the culture. <laughs> you know, the culture is the culture and that's the thing that you want to hold on to. Um, and it's exactly the breakdown of culture that, that leaves people feeling uh, insecure actually. So it wouldn't be a transformation of culture but rather it would be an, a, a contextualizing of how does your culture fit into the context of where this is going. Um, and that I think is more enriching and more open, you know, encouraging students to be, and teachers who are delivering it to be open-minded, is that how does the culture we have, which we never let go of, that is who we are in, inherently, we are, have a certain culture that is within us, but how, what does that look like when we put it into a different context? I hope that gives okay. some, some idea to what Thank you, Dr. Colin. Dr. Lily, would you okay. like to add some explanation? Um, yeah, I mean, not so much an explanation, just uh, Australia is like Indonesia. It's a country with um, many different cultures. And so what Australia has decided, we basically have a national curriculum that we call the Australian curriculum that is being implemented by all the individual states and adapted just a little bit to the local context. But pretty much everyone sort of gets the same um, contents and standards and expectations. Um, the only standout um, cultural group that it becomes is becoming increasingly important important or is um, well where teachers are trying to increasingly implement or integrate cultural content is Australian Aboriginal education where this cultural knowledge that has been around for 60 80,000 years is slowly making its way into the mainstream curriculum. So that's what I would like to say is special about Australia. And this is still work in progress. So we have still a lot of work to do in this area. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lily, for the question. Thank you, Dr. Colin, for the answer. And I think we, I don't know, we still have a question or not. Uh, or maybe for the participant who want to give a direct question, we are pleased you to do that by clicking the hand raise feature on your Zoom. Anyone, please? Okay, maybe I need to check the other question. While we wait for a direct question, maybe for from UNESA's lecture or from the other participants 
who want to give direct question? Okay. Question. Sorry, Mrs. Zavira. Yeah. A question that uh, still have not been read by the moderator from Nia Ayu. Oh, okay. And how about from Aristia? Yeah, from Miss Aristia as well. Okay. Okay. Maybe I can share screen the question. Wait a minute. Okay. Share screen. Okay, share it. Okay. We have question from Aristia to Miss Lily. Okay, the question is it has been explained that in Australia the education system has specialized in science. No, this question already answered. And okay, answered. the other question is from Ayu Andira to Professor Dr. Kusairi. How can a child best identify his environment without being overly wrong in order to become a literacy for a child? Professor Kusairi? Okay. Okay. Ms. Safira. Mm -hmm. Let me share screen. Okay, so, I will stop share. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> jadi untuk menjawab pertanyaan ini ada tiga hal yang kita akses ya. Jadi tidak hanya melalui literasi membaca dan numerasi untuk mengidentifikasi anak yang memiliki kepekaan atau apapun. Maka kita lakukan survei karakter. Jadi melalui pertanyaan-pertanyaan uh, atau questioner yang sudah kita siapkan. Ini khusus untuk anak. Jadi bagaimana jiwa Pancasilanya yang akan mengidentifikasi uh, enam profil pemuda uh, pelajar Pancasila Indonesia. Jadi kita ingin lihat dari sisi akhlaknya seperti apa, apa yang kita identifikasi dari hasil tes di kedua assessment, kita cross-check dengan uh, hasil questionnaire ini. Kira-kira itu, jadi saling melengkapi nantinya hasilnya sehingga antar satu dengan yang lain nanti kita bandingkan. Demikian, terima kasih. Oke, okay. oke, okay, the question from Arintia. If I'm not mistake, mistaken, ya. Yeah. Uh, the answer from Professor Kusairi is for answering the question, there are three things to do for uh, by the teachers, for the students. The first one is literacy, the second one is numeracy, and the third one is character survey through questionnaire. And all the results will be completed one another. I think that's, uh, yeah, the translation, brief translation of the answer. And now, I don't know, maybe we, do we still have a time for the Q&A session? The committee? Should we continue the session or we have to close it? Okay, Ayu Andira say thank to you, Professor Kusairi for answering the question. Yeah. Um, maybe, yeah, there is no other question here. Okay, I will try to give another opportunity for the participants. 
maybe I'll count it in 10 seconds. If there is no other question, then we can move to the next agenda. Okay, I'll start to count from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one yay okay then <laughs> okay then i close the q a session then we move to the next agenda okay ladies and gentlemen now we come to the end of the session today it seems that all the participants very enthusiastic listening all the presentations i could highlight the point of today's talk which are about um the dynamic world makes everything, including education, moves and growth super fast. And this situation required us to think divergent and convergent in order to solve complex problems. And also, but knowing that the real threat and challenge in the 21st century is the loss of community, as Dr. Colin said before, makes us have to be effective teachers that can do self-reflection have to give impact on the student, on the environment, on the community, even on the world. And the last point that I can take from Professor Kusairi uh, is how important assessment is providing accurate information to the teacher as a basis to improve learning quality, improve positive changes in teaching and student learning. I'm sure we all we all learn a lot from today's seminar and i hope what we gain from the speakers today could be beneficial and we could implement it in the real context of learning engagement well ladies and gentlemen before i close this keynote speech session we will have certificate submission for all the speakers on behalf of the committee i would like to say thank you very much for all the speakers and here is the committee present a virtual certificate of appreciation. We start from our first speaker. There is a certificate displayed on the screen for Ibu Lily Taylor, PhD, MSCM Cons. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Ibu Lily. <laughs> Second certificate for Dr. Colin Fletcher. Yeah, the certificate is ready on the screen. Thank you thank so, you. so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Ibu Colin. And the last one is for Professor Dr. Kusairi MPD. Okay, thank you, Ms. Shafira. Terima kasih, bro. Yeah. Okay, all the audience, please give our virtual applause for our amazing speakers today. Okay. And to all the seminar attendees, thank you for your participation. I do apologize for any shortcomings and inconveniences. See you in another occasion. It's time for me to give it back to the MC. Back to you, Miss Sinta. Thank you very much for the speakers for delivering such informative and insightful presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Zaviva, for, the, for moderating the presentation as well. Distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, we have some inspiring time together in this event. Those are the agendas we have presented to you today. As we have finished our session, coming up to the last session, we are going to have a closing ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, as we are about to end the event, let's say hamdallah together. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Hopefully, what we learned today can be useful for all of us. Amin. Well, this thing is, ladies and gentlemen, before we end this quick meeting, please allow us to, do, to tell you about a few information about our webinar today. Today's webinar is part of serious activities, Kelet Esco Fest, which is a major festival held by Elementary Teacher Education Student Association. And we had just watched together about the video teaser of Escofest in the opening of the webinar today. 
Of course, apart from our webinar this time, we still have many other events that are no less interesting, such as merchandise pre-order, raise funds, also dancing and singing competition. For further information about our next program series, please look forward at our, at our social media at hmg underscore pgsunesa on Instagram. Baik, Bapak dan Ibu hadirin sekalian, mungkin bisa saya informasikan kembali bahwa kegiatan webinar hari ini merupakan bagian dari serangkaian acara bernama ESCOFES yang merupakan sebuah festival besar yang diadakan oleh Himpunan Mahasiswa Jurusan Pendidikan Guru Sekolah Dasar Universitas Negeri Surabaya, di mana kita juga telah menyaksikan video teaser dari acara ESCOFES ini secara bersama-sama pada saat pembukaan acara hari ini. Tentunya, selain webinar ini, kami juga masih memiliki banyak acara lain yang tak kalah menarik seperti pre-order merchandise, penggalangan dana, serta lomba tari dan bernyanyi. Oleh karenanya, untuk informasi lebih lanjut mengenai acara kami, dimohon kepada Bapak dan Ibu hadirin sekalian untuk menantikan informasi-informasi terbarunya pada laman media sosial kami, yakni at hmj underscore di Instagram. Well, thank you very much for listening to the flash information. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please be ready and open the camera to all of participants, also the guests and the speakers, because we will take the picture as a documentation. picture in three, two, one, and done. Okay, so we already have your picture here for documentation. Thank you very much. I would like to apologize if there are any mistakes. Thank you very much all participants for joining us today and may all of us have a great life now and after. Amen. For the certificate of this webinar, you can access by the link that will be shared in the chat room along with the attendance link. So please don't forget to fill the link with correct information. And if there are any problems, you can contact our contact person through the number list on the flyer. I think that's all for me. Thank you very much and see you in the next occasion. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Kali. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> See you. See you. Recording stopped. Kita
Thank you.